So far, we saw that in the Bayesian setting, we could obtain predictive distributions which were no longer dependent on the model parameters W. The predictions in the end are entirely based on the data, or let's say entirely based on the experience gained so far. In this video, we'll have a closer look at what this actually means and see that it gives us a new viewpoint on modeling, namely through kernels. So this is what we saw in the previous uh, video, that in this Bayesian regression setting, my, in the end I have predictive distributions which no longer depend on W because they were marginalized out via this Bayesian model averaging. Uh, and that's indicated over here, right? So we have a predictive distribution for each uh, W and we take a weighted average or this integral and we weight each uh, distribution with uh, the posterior for W. So the probability that that particular W uh, defined a good model. And that in the end gives us a predictive distribution which no longer depends on W. Now these predictive distributions, so they, they predict for each given uh, input X prime, the probabilities for the, the corresponding target uh, T prime taking on some values. And this uh, probability distribution was parameterized via a Gaussian, right? So uh, with a particular mean given as follows and a particular standard uh, deviation or variance. So the mean for this predictive distribution around X uh, prime is given by uh, this product of uh, a mean vector mn and uh, the, the basis vector, so the, the feature vector uh, evaluated at x prime. And this mean vector mn really describes a particular set of, of model weights, which were obtained via the maximum posterior solution for w. So this mn is an element of rm, it's an m-dimensional vector. So this MN really is like my Bayesian averaged model parameters. And then to, in order to turn this, uh, uh, this into a mean prediction uh, for every point X prime, I just uh, take the product with the basis function. So this really is expanding the basis using these uh, weights. And that gives me a prediction for the mean for my uh, target distribution at point X prime. Okay, and now the main point here is that this predictive distribution it depends on my basis functions and the X prime, but nowhere do we see uh, the W's anymore. Uh, so my predictive distribution at X prime is completely determined by my uh, data points, really. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make this a bit more explicit by really writing out uh, what this predictive mean looks like. So I'm going to call this mean, this predictive mean, I'm going to call it Y X prime MN. So it's a linear model. Uh, which maps uh, an X prime to uh, a particular mean and it is parameterized by uh, MN. Okay, so I'm writing out this term, which is the predictive mean. Okay, so really let's just fill in this expression over here and write it out. And I'm going to write it out in such a way that it becomes very clear how my predictions uh, are obtained via a linear combination of my data points. Okay, so let's just start writing this out. So I have beta phi x prime transpose covariance matrix and times the design matrix transpose times t. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this particular term here. Uh, so really this is matrix vector multiplication. So I do rho times vector, rho times vector. So I'm going to make this a sum. I'm going to explicitly write it out. So that gives me, well, the first part is the same. So beta phi x prime transpose sn and then the sum and the sum looks like this right so i'm looping or summing over my uh, n so over my n data points and every time i take the product of tn so of tn together with this particular vector of uh, well feature values so the basis function is evaluated at that point so that's what we see over here right so we're going to this thing will be uh, this blue vector indicated over there for each n. Okay, so this sum eventually gives me a vector um, in of size uh, of length m, which will form like the new vector for this next matrix vector multiplication with uh, Sn. Now I'm going to move uh, the sum up front. So sum over n is one to n beta phi x prime transpose sn and 
And then I know that these factors, that's really the same uh, basis factor, right? So I can write it out as follows. So that would place here this feature vector for each end data point um, yeah, times tn. So and finally, I'm going to give a name to this particular thing. I'm going to call this the kernel and define it as follows. So really I'm taking the sum n is 1 to n of my kernel, x, which is a function of x prime and x and n, tn. So that's uh, this thing over here. Uh, I'm just going to write that here. So this kernel is really defined as beta phi x prime transpose as n phi xn. So really this is something that we define. We say the kernel is defined in such a way. So really what we did was uh, we rewrote the expression for the predictive mean to make very explicit how my predictions are formed via a linear combination of my existing data points. Uh, so this was done via an equivalent kernel. So for each uh, basis functions I can define a particular equivalent kernel that describes yeah, again, how my predictions are formed as a linear combination of my data points. So for a given x prime, um, I can fill in this x prime in this kernel and then retrieve the weights that I'm going to assign to each target in my data by evaluating uh, the corresponding x ends. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what this uh, kernel uh, looks like. So this is the expression for the kernel that we obtained. And with this kernel, we can obtain predictions uh, for the means for my target values. And what we actually see nicely here is that um, the kernel values uh, are large whenever x prime and x are close to each other. So let me write this out. So on this axis we have x and on this axis we have x prime. Right? We have a 2D kernel of two input arguments, an x and an x prime. So the diagonal corresponds to points that are close to each other, right? And red in this plot means high values. So the kernel takes on high values whenever x and x prime are close to each other and whenever they're distant uh, from one another it takes on uh, smaller values. So this means if I want to make a prediction for around a particular x prime, so I take a look at this x prime over here, then these are the corresponding weights that I assign to the targets um, in my data set. So the targets in my data sets are here indicated with x. So whenever um, x, so a particular xn is close to x prime, so that's a point over here, I assign large weights and when I move away from this point I uh, assign low weights. So this is a really interesting observation, right? So it tells us that uh, predictions uh, around a particular x prime are dominated uh, by my training data points which are really close to uh, x prime. So in that sense, you could say that the kernel quantifies the amount of similarity or let's say affinity between two uh, data points. Now, this particular example was taken from the book of Bishop where uh, they considered some regression problem, uh, in this case using Gaussian basis functions. And I want to stress here that we see this sort of locality property of these kernels that similar or close by points contribute more to the predictions than far away points. So really uh, the weights are sort of localized. This behavior we see that in all sorts of uh, basis functions, so not just for Gaussian basis functions but also for polynomials which are highly non-localized, right? So this locality property is something that we see over a, a wide range of, of basis functions. It actually follows from the continuity of these basis functions. Okay, so we see that training points close to x prime contribute more to the prediction uh, at that particular point. Okay, so that's one viewpoint on these kernels, but we could also approach it slightly different by looking at really at the, the covariance between two uh, predictions. So uh, what I'm considering now is um, I'll make two predictions. So one around x1 and one around x2. So this, uh, my model gives me a predictive distribution for, for each of these uh, x1 and x prime. And I'm going to look at the covariance between these predictions. Okay, now it turns out that this covariance uh, is given by the covariance between my models over my model parameters w, right? Uh, so we saw that actually that uncertainty in my prediction uh, actually comes from uncertainty in my model parameters in the end. Uh, we saw that with these uh, plus one, minus one uh, standard deviation intervals or also by explicitly showing that uh, given my data I could fit multiple 
uh, functions to it, right? With multiple Ws. And now if we take the covariance of these models, um, so around these two data points uh, with respect to W, um, we can write it out and show that this actually leads to uh, uh, the kernel itself. Okay, so let's just write out the definition of uh, the covariance between these two uh, model predictions. And of course, it doesn't really matter if I put the W on the left or right hand side. This is just a scalar product. Um, I'm putting here the W on the left hand side because I need that in my derivation. Um, so the covariance is really given by the expectation over W of the product of my models. So X1 transpose W, W transpose I x2 minus um, the product of the two expectations. So the expectation over w Okay, now I can make use of the linearity of these expectations. So the expectation is taken over w. So these terms, so these uh, phi uh, vectors, they do not depend uh, on W, so I can move them outside. I'm going to move this to the left and this to the right. Also here, this to the left and this to the right. So I can see, uh, I can write this as follows. Right, I move the, the phi's outside to the left and to the right. And so this expectation is, uh, these expectations are uh, sort of sandwiched in, in between. And well, we recognize this as the expression for the covariance for W itself. So actually I'm computing here um, phi x1 transpose with the covariance matrix of W with itself and then phi x2 on the right hand side. Okay, and we know what the covariance of W is because uh, we say that the W is drawn from this posterior distribution, which is a, a Gaussian distribution which has a particular mean and a particular covariance. So uh, the covariance of W is really directly given by this uh, covariance matrix Sn. So this entire thing is given by phi x1 transpose Sn phi x2. And now again, we recognize the form for uh, the kernel, which is given over here. So really the covariance between two predictions is given by 1 over beta, the kernel, x1, x2. Okay, let me mark that down. So the covariance between two predictions uh, is given by uh, this kernel, is quantified by this kernel, uh, k. Okay, great. So we see that for our Bayesian regression with basis functions, we can derive a so-called equivalent kernel, which quite explicitly describes how my predictions are formed by a linear combination of my data, and it takes on the interpretation as the amount of covariance uh, between predictions for different data points. Um, well, we also saw that the kernel tends to be localized, and uh, meaning that data points that are close by contribute more to the predictions than uh, data points that are far away. And this is actually a really nice result, which we're happy to see, right? Because uh, this was sort of to be expected from the intuition that points close by would well, uh, would have similar uh, predictive values. Um, okay, so we just saw that in the case of Bayesian regression with basis functions, we could derive a viewpoint based on equivalent kernels. And for now, we leave it as it is, but later on in this course, we will return to this kernel-based viewpoint and directly work with formulations based on kernels without defining upfront what the corresponding basis functions are. And as we will see, this will eventually lead to a very generic approach to regression.